Everybody. So the goals of my uh, paper uh, first. So my paper aims at presenting both the materiality of time and the conceptual vision of time in Stendhal. I will present the idea of Stendhal as seeing himself ahead of his time. I'll present how he's locating himself in his time and explain what it means for him to be a modern writer. Finally, I will show how his view of himself as a modern writer leads him to reinterpret and play with the form of the classical Bildungsroman and give, him, uh, uh, give this form a makeover. So I believe Stendhal has something to offer to our modern challenges with time. In today's world, in search of ever greater speed, car, train, planes, and immediacy, social media, l'info en continu, the cult of permanent life, I hardly see two trendy ideas that are not about going fast. Uh, economic degrowth and mindfulness. So Stendhal is famous for his philosophy of happiness and love. But it's a transcendental conception of happiness and love, often experienced in the worst uh, material conditions, the prison. And one could wonder what Stendhal would think of this material conception of happiness, of the material dimension of Hige, uh, centered around little objects like candle, uh, whole socks, coffee table, etc. Sounds surprising as well, but degrowth, or criticism of this society which is going too fast, has to do with Stendhal, who lived the most of his life in a pre-industrial world and nourished a critique of industrialism. Stendhal sees the sacralization of work as a typically modern and American menace. He notably says, L'industrialisme veut faire travailler tout le monde. Dès qu'il n'y aura plus de dolce far niente, on ne trouvera plus personne pour goûter l'Orlando de la Rioste ou les statues de Canova. It is a menace both to literature and art. At some point, the Abbé Blanès says to Fabrice, Peut-être dans 50 ans ne voudra-t-on plus d'oisif, which is an almost direct reference to Saint-Simon. At a time when speed in an almost frenetic acceleration governs human life. We rediscover with a certain voluptuousness that era when hours were running without haste. Reading old novels is also about the pleasure of reconnecting with old rhythms. Um, so let me talk first about Stendhal's sense of being ahead of his time. This is uh, from Grenoble's archives. It's an unpublished paper written by Stendhal, probably around 1802, about his daily activities. He writes things like, il ne faut pas consacrer aux actions de tous les jours plus de temps qu'il n'en est nécessaire, and gives organization advice. So we see that he's following a strict schedule as confirmed by a passage from the journal, uh, which uh, is not here, but from uh, which I drew Stendhal's daily timetable. So 6 a.m. wake up, 10 p.m. going to bed. We are a little appalled by the seriousness of this 19-year-old young man. Uh, but let me switch to a more conceptual vision of time. If Stendhal's working so much, it's because he fences himself ahead of his time. Stendhal's sense of being modern shows through the recurring use of this mention to the happy few, probably inspired by Shakespeare, which we find in all these works. Very often, uh, this idea of writing to, for the happy few gets further developed, as you can see in uh, chapter one of Souvenir des Gautismes and Lucien Leven. Mais les yeux qui liront ceci s'ouvrent à peine à la lumière. Je suppute que mes futurs lecteurs ont 10 ou 12 ans. And j'ai trouvé tant de plaisir à passer les soirées avec eux. Sometimes he even fancies that his future reader is in a cradle in the house next door. Stendhal is writing with his future readers in mind. He's embracing them, and this empathy for them stands in contrast to his usual scathing criticisms toward his contemporaries. This sense of being au courant often comes with the metaphor of the lottery. 
Ars longa, vita brevis, as the phrase goes. I'm only worth being reprinted in 1900. I've bought into a lottery in which the biggest prize is reduced to the following, being read in 1935, he says. The date changes, writing for future readers is risky. Stendhal doesn't know if this gamble will pay off. You can draw many links with contemporary cultural icons concerned with their posterity. Kanye West constantly says that he'll be understood later. <laughs> it is not only that he'll be appreciated later, but it's also that he'll be accepted later, as shown by mentions like a imprimé dix ans après ma mort. Si la police rend imprudente la publication, on attendra dix ans. Half of what he writes is censored by government censors, but he too has to censor himself in order to keep his career and his standing in society. In the manuscripts, Stendhal disguises the words, he cross-dresses the ideas, he encrypts everything that concerns religion and politics. Thus, this little dictionary I put here to read the manuscripts, honest means spy, lispo means the police, etc. It's the brûlard self, it's his taste for adventure and brigandage. With Stendhal, being modern comes with a whole philosophy of romanticism. This is Stendhal locating himself in his time and explaining what it means for him to be a modern writer. Today, in France, we have this debate about the reconstruction of Notre Dame de Paris between the supporters of a contemporary reconstruction and those supporters of an identical reconstruction. This revives the querelle des anciens et des modernes. Stendhal finds a very interesting third way in his famous essay, Racine et Shakespeare. First, let's look at the title. Both terms are linked by the coordinate conjunction E, not OU, which makes a difference. Indeed, the essay evolves around not two, but three terms, classic, romantique, romanticiste. The two first ones are established terms, whereas the last one is borrowed from English to make a specific point. Stendhal coins romanticiste in French as a term of art. Being romanticiste is more about being modern and about being self-aware than it is about being romantique. Being romanticiste is about being self-consciously modern and it's about pandering to an audience. It's a plea for authors to not get stale. Thus this paradoxical affirmation, je n'hésite pas à avancer que Racine a été romantique. Sophocles, Euripides, Racine were eminently romantic, but imitating them today and pretending that these imitations won't make the public yawn, this is classicism. Stendhal continues playing with words and creating neologisms to prove the modernity of his vision. He notably coins the term begulisme as the antithesis of bellisme. His real name was not Stendhal, it was Henri Bale. Begulisme is, according to him, the art of being offended for virtues we don't have. In literature, it's the art of enjoying taste we don't actually feel. The author needs to be up to date and fashion in order to be pleasing to his public. What is taste? It's the literary equivalent of knowing how to tie one's tie neatly. Here Stendhal recommends to pander to the people's tastes. Here Stendhal is basically the ultimate aesthetic populist. So Stendhal spends his time among the aristocracy. He visits aristocratic homes and frequents Le Beau Monde, but doesn't share their nostalgia of the Ancien Régime. He despises those who in the Restoration and July Monarchy Salon imitate their great-grandparents a little too much. Both this feeling of being a modern and the sense of living late in the history together shape his vision slash perversion of the Bildungsroman. Indeed, Stendhal turns the Bildungsroman on its head. Um, he manifests a modern vision in his novels while keeping in dialogue with this model of the coming of age novel. Here, I listed uh, a few characteristics of the Bildungsroman. Uh, let me highlight a few. So we expect the transformation of a young provincial into maturity, thus legitimizing the social cultural forms. At the end of the novel, we would expect the hero to be in a stable and honorable situation. As for the ethical message of the novel, the general idea would be that success is achieved through sustained effort. I'll go through them one by one later for Stendhal. But first, a few general thoughts about time and the plotting, la mise en intrigue. When writing a work, there's a choice to be made between Aristotle and St. Augustine's vision of time. 
between the Aristotelian couple Mimesis Metos, according to which a plot should be a work of synthesis, complying with ressemblance, with Aristotle, purposes, causes, hazards are gathered under the temporal unity of a total and complete action. So a choice is to be made between Aristotle and Saint Augustine, who acknowledges uh, that time inconsistently folds and unfolds, ce temps et ce détend de façon discordante. Time is inconsistent, and as we see here, present immediately passes into time past. Time has no surface to stick to. And I think Stendhal's vision of romanticism uh, is very close to that. We hear all the time in the French media that the president of France, whose favorite author is Stendhal, by the way, that he is le maître des horloges. I think the expression is good here for our purpose. Here Stendhal truly is le maître des horloges. So first, um, instead of a gradual development transformation from youth into mature men that we would expect in a Bildung, here in Stendhal's novel, uh, we have a modern, spontaneous and almost absurd end product. Uh, with no effort, out of the blue, Julien is ennobled, he becomes Monsieur le Chevalier Julien Sorel de la Vernet, and gets a new social position without effort. He was made a lieutenant without ever having been a second lieutenant, only in command of a regiment of which he had never heard. Similarly, in La Chartreuse, as soon as Fabrice enters the Battle of Waterloo, his bolting horse leads him to the group of the glorious Maréchal Ney. This is quite a serendipitous success for such a naive and inexperienced man. Two, instead of legitimizing the social cultural forms, Stendhal constantly denounces the vanity of society. He despises the stereotype of the jeune courtisan français, all those in his time who are imitating the 1770s, imitating Bézinval or any jeune courtisan of the court of Louis, uh, uh, Louis XV, 16th, sorry. Um, he despises the most uh, reactionary sovereign of Italy, François uh, IV, Archduke of Austria, Prince of Hungary and Bohemia, nicknamed the Little Nero of Modena, who typifies the legitimist. He's the person who inspired Ranus Ernest IV, Prince of Parma in the Chartreuse de Parme. Three, the hero's miserable demise is very far from the stability of the maturity at the end of the Bildung. Fabrice dies in the Chartreuse Monastery, Julien is imprisoned and beheaded, Lamiel dies in a fire, etc. Four, um, we all know there's one road which is very busy in 19th century novels, namely that from the provinces to Paris. The young heroes come to make their fortune in Paris, to make something of themselves. Going to Paris is the traditional trajectory of 19th century eponymous heroes. Stendhal turns this image on its head. The hero is someone who leaves Paris to go, into, to go out into the provinces. This is a polemical idea, but I have three arguments. Stendhal himself is a provincial from Grenoble. He notably writes, Vous passeriez 20 ans à Paris que vous ne connaîtriez pas la France. And uh, les hommes de mérite de l'an 1850 seront pris pour la plupart loin de Paris. At the end of Le Rouge et le Noir, Julien chooses his provincial love, Madame de Rénal, over her Parisian counterpart, Mathilde de la Mole. In the Chartreuse de Parme, this is not Paris, but still the capital versus the provinces, Fabrice leaves the safety of Parma to go back to his home state. He risks his life by traveling to the Lombardo Venetian kingdom to see l'abbé Planès. Fifth, uh, contrary to the model of the Bildungsroman, the Stendhalian hero chooses the longest route. Au lieu de se retirer par la ligne la plus courte et de gagner les bords du lac majeur où sa barque l'attendait, Fabrice faisait un énorme détour pour aller voir son arbre. Fabrice is pursued by the Lombardo Venetian police and he goes to see his tree. I know we'll talk about Beckett after this presentation, so I put two quotations which show how the Stendhalian hero constantly forgets his goal to enjoy the journey in a way that is gratuite and absurd. Here we are with an aesthetic of the road for the road's sake. Because the road is the only chivalrous place after 1815. The Stendhalian hero is a phony knight, an anti-hero who roams aimlessly, just flees from the gendarme. The road is the place of imagination, sensation and reflection. 
the road and the vehicle that it supposes, i.e. the horse, which is a sensation multiplier for this funny night. The hero thinks more, feels more, wishes more on the back of his horse. The road experience, I'm wondering, the road experience, the journey, is an, an, an accelerator for the hero's faculties. It enhances his abilities, it participates in an increase of his awareness at three levels, imagination, sensation and thought. In Flaubert in Balzac, the characters know which kind of job they want to achieve. They have concrete professional vocations. In Stendhal, it's only the journey that matters. All this contributes to a desultory narration. Success is achieved through sustained effort in Bildung, but in Stendhal, it's a constant defense of idleness. So to conclude, there's really in Stendhal something of a treat yourself philosophy. And for me, Stendhal is the first novelist to present the most serious acts in men's life as being essentially governed by fantasy, carelessness, and the impulses of the moment. Sometimes his characters' journeys are poorly motivated, their actions are difficult to understand and seem counterproductive, and yet this anthropology of freedom does not have a pessimistic or negative connotation. This is what I think is the most appealing to this author, who was so little understood by his time. Thank you.